found it useful. So, well, this is problematic, but <laughs> uh, I need two left hands. Uh, I'm going to share with you some thoughts, a little bit of um, analysis of uh, one of my favorite writers. Anybody want to guess? <laughs> 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 wow. Um, I'm going to be reading today from Emerson's essay entitled Wealth. Seems like a very good capstone and send off for this particular group. A group of people who have tremendous talents and huge hearts and want to do a lot of good in the world. And so, I, but I want to send you off with some thoughts about money. Because those of us with big hearts kind of struggle with this money thing sometimes. And I want you to hear Emerson's words because he's going to say some things that may, particularly for those of you who've read Emerson, might strike you as being un Emersonian. And I think that the more that I have delved into this man's mind, the more I have seen his intense realism over and above what is perceived to be his idealism. So he begins, as soon as a stranger is introduced into any company, one of the first questions which all wish to have answered is, how does that man get his living? And with reason. He is no whole man until he knows how to earn a blameless livelihood. Society is barbarous until every industrious man can get his living without dishonest customs. Every man is a consumer and ought to be a producer. He fails to make his place good in the world unless he not only pays his debts, but adds also something to the commonwealth. Nor can he do justice to his genius without making some larger demand on the world than a bare subsistence. He is by constitution expensive and needs to be rich. I find in working with people who are oriented toward science and technology, that the question of money is terribly complicated. A lot of people go into science and technology for the pure intellectual pursuit, the pursuit of knowledge, the pursuit of justice, the pursuit of a better world, and they see this at odds with money that money is the enemy, it's corrupting. And I'm speaking personally, using I statement here about this subject because it is my own personal struggle and has been for a long time. And I'm very fortunate that Emerson, along with some living people like Michael here, have beaten me to a pulp about this subject. And it's one that I've spent a lot of time thinking about. When, when Emerson here says that a genius must make a greater demand on the world than a bare subsistence, this, this statement kind of jars me out of my monastic complacency. I rather like living sort of a, as a monk. It's pretty straightforward, not a lot of complications. The only thing in my life that I consider true luxury is having my dogs. <coughs> and uh, they have relatively predictable demands. And I used to think that that acceptance of subsistence living was uh, inherently virtuous that that was a, a thing to aspire to. And then I wouldn't need money, and everything would be okay. Spiritual integrity quite intact. But 
Emerson tells us in Self-Reliance that nothing can bring you peace but the triumph of principles. And you might say, well, what does that have to do with money? Well, when I look out at the world, I don't see a world that's operating by what I think are righteous principles. I don't see a world organized according to the principles that I hold dear. And as it turns out, it's really difficult for those principles to triumph if I check out of the subject of money and go to my room, read my books, and say, ah, all of that is just a bit too dirty for me. It's a cop-out. It's actually a form of intellectual laziness, a rejection of the world as it is. It's a utopian desire for a world that has never been and probably never will be. And if I run away from making one of those larger demands on the world, just because the messiness of considering financial mechanisms, then logic says, if I buy Emerson's premise, then I'm not going to find any peace. And I've, I've met a lot of middle-aged intellectuals, a lot of university professors, who are not at peace. They say, well, I have my research, and it's nice, but of course, it wasn't what I thought it would be. I thought seeking truth would lead to the world changing. And I meet a lot of young people who thought going to university, studying what they were supposed to study, was the path to changing the world. Check off these boxes, get those credentials, and then you'll, give, you'll be given permission to change the world. But we don't need permission to change the world. We only need the power to change the world. And as a famous Italian once said, real power cannot be given, it must be taken. A few of you get the reference. <coughs> it's not me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, are, you, are, you are the character's avatar, though, I think. <laughs> And right now, we have at our fingertips a world with the fewest barriers to entry for anybody who wants to go acquire the resources to make a difference. But you have, like anything, if you want to be good at it, if you want to use a tool well, you have to study it. You have to practice it. You have to commit yourself to it. If you want to play a musical instrument, and you want to play it well, you want to be on a stage where people desire to listen to you, and not just in your room, kind of squawking around for your own amusement, you have to practice, day in and day out, mostly the boring parts, scales and arpeggios and etudes and things. And in business, it's the same thing. And technology and science need to find a rapprochement with business and money. I, I gave a speech a couple of years ago to a high energy physics conference. It's a very peculiar audience for me. Uh, all of the people in the room had doctorates in physics. Uh, and and they, the host was, uh, he had been involved in a lot of US government projects, had done some things with DARPA, these sort of things. 
And he, so one of our, our staff members had kind of run it, bumped into him by accident and said, hey, you should get Skinner to go talk to your guys. Well, what's he going to talk about? Don't worry, it'll be interesting. <laughs> and, uh, and so we didn't tell them really exactly what I was going to talk about. And I showed up and I was looking around I was looking at the brochure or the, the schedule and you know, they had all this like thank yous to the US Navy and other people that were sponsors of the conference. I was thinking, ah, I've got it now. Uh, and, and I started giving them a bit of a thought experiment about what if science were funded by scientists rather than by murderers. <laughs> <laughs> All of the oxygen in the room was kind of sucked out. <laughs> and my point was, if you learned how to apply your technical skills, and you just learned that like, if you're that smart to do high energy physics, you're smart enough to do some business. It's not that bad. And I said, if, if you just applied those skills that you have to create a few things that could be sold to people, you could fund your own research, and you wouldn't need to go begging the US Navy to fund it for you. Because acquiring those resources changes the whole dynamic of the game. And the, the guy, had the, the organizer, had a relatively good sense of humor. And it, when he got up at the end of, uh, of my talk, he, gave, he started his talk, which was the final closing remark of the, the whole event. And he said, well, I'd first like to thank our sponsors. And then sort of says, yes, the US military. And then he just quickly jumped on. It clearly made an impact. But whatever you're doing, If you're, if you're going running, or you're doing an exercise regimen, you want to build muscle, you have to give your muscles energy, right? You can't starve yourself and build muscle. Everything needs energy. And money is a form of energy in the economy. So you have to go get some in order to not only survive, but to make some greater demand on the world. Emerson goes on, and he, he goes on, waxes quite eloquently about how he doesn't use the word entrepreneur, but he's talking about entrepreneurs see a field and imagine a town. They see coal lying under the ground and imagine it as heating during the winter in the upper Midwest. And he goes through all of his examples, but then he gets on and he, he continues this line of thinking. He says, every warehouse and shop, every fruit tree, Every thought of every hour opens a new want to him, which it concerns his power and dignity to gratify. It is of no use to argue the wants down. The philosophers have laid the greatness of man in making his wants few, but will a man content himself with a hut and a handful of dried peas? He is born to be rich. He is thoroughly related and is tempted out by his appetites and fancies to the conquest of this and that piece of nature until he finds his well-being in the use of his planet and of more planets than his own. Wealth requires, besides the crust of bread and the roof, the freedom of the city, the freedom of the earth, traveling, machinery, the benefits of science, music, and fine arts, the best culture, and the best company. He doesn't see any of these things as being in isolation, as separate concerns, but one single concern, the nourishment 
of the mind and the spirit that produces all of the great feats of science and engineering and business and art and music all come from the same source, which is up here in the human mind. And he, he talks about wealth in the terms of the conquest of nature. Sounds very strange in 2017 to hear anything about nature other than, oh, it's this thing over here, we should probably do something about protecting it from people who've never been to it. But Emerson had a very different idea about nature because he, he saw us as being part of it. And he saw it as being the source of wealth and opportunity. And science is just the understanding of nature. And anybody who tells you it's some other thing, some other idea that belongs in a certain place under certain conditions is misunderstanding what science is. And misunderstanding that all business is science. Because business is about people doing things, making decisions, and we're part of nature. And so understanding how people behave is part of understanding nature and part of how the entrepreneur can create wealth, not only for yourself, but for all. He is the rich man who can avail himself of all men's faculties. He is the richest man who knows how to draw benefit from the labors of the greatest number of men, of men in distant countries, and in past times. The same correspondence that is between thirst in the stomach and water in the spring exists between the whole of man and the whole of nature. The elements offer their service to him. The sea washing the equator and the poles offers its perilous aid and the power and empire that follow it day by day to his craft and audacity. Beware of me, it says, but if you can hold me, I am the key to all the lands. And a lot of times, people who know money, who come from finance, ask me why I care so much about science. It just doesn't seem connected. There's a missing link there. No. Wealth is derived from understanding. True wealth, not mere parasitism. Parasites take from others. Wealthy people create from nature and harness its power that it offers up freely, if you will only understand it. He goes on to say, for those of you who might still be in doubt, who might still say, ah, yes, but the pauper's life is all right for me. I don't really need all of that. He says, the subject of economy mixes itself with morals inasmuch as it is a peremptory point of virtue that a man's independence be secured. Poverty demoralizes. A man in debt is so far a slave and Wall Street thinks it easy for a millionaire to be a man of his word, a man of honor, but that, in failing circumstances, no man can be relied on to keep his integrity. But if he wishes the power and privilege of thought, of chalking out his own career, and having society on his own terms, he must bring his wants within proper power to satisfy. His point is that it's very hard to be a moral person if you depend on somebody else for your food. It's inherently compromising. And so a dedication to understanding the means and mechanisms of creating wealth is a pathway to independence, an independence where principle 
can dry up. The manly part is to do with might and main what you can do. The world is full of fops who never did anything and who have persuaded beauties and men of genius to wear their fop livery, and these will deliver the fop opinion that it is not respectable to be seen earning a living, that it is much more respectable to spend without earning, and this doctrine of the snake will come also from the elect sons of light, for wise men are not wise at all hours, and will speak five times from their taste or their humor to once from their reason. Theodore Roosevelt also talks about the fops in his famous speech to the Sorbonne, where he says that the credit doesn't belong to the critic, but to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by the dust and the blood and the sweat. Not the bystander, who knows how he would have done it right if it had been him, and happy to tell you all the ways you were doing it wrong but rather the person out there taking the risks, putting themselves on the line, and willing to take the consequences if things don't go well. And he says that it is this desire to conquer nature, to understand it, to maneuver through it, to redirect its forces. This is what benefits the totality of the human race. So the man of the mind, telegraph, mill, map, and survey, the monomaniacs, this is very key here, the monomaniacs, the people who just fixate on the one thing and can't let it go, who talk up their project in marts and offices and entreat men to subscribe. How did our factories get built? How did North America get netted with iron rails except by the importunity of these orators who dragged all the prudent men in? Is party the madness of many for the gain of a few? This speculative genius is the madness of few for the gain of the world. The projectors are sacrificed but the public is the gainer. For those of you who may have read Nassim Taleb's work, Anti-Fragile, he even talks about how we should have Vet Entrepreneur's Day in the same vein as like Veterans Day, celebrating the fallen heroes who took the risks and failed and made all of us better off as a result. But he says, then looking at the alternative, Politicians, He says, kings are said to have long arms, but every man should have long arms and should pluck his living, his instruments, his power, and his knowing from the sun, moon, and stars. And if you look at the truly great civilizations in history, they were all astronomers, just worth pointing out. And he mentions this here, knowing from the sun, moon, and stars. Is not then the demand to be rich legitimate? Yet, I have never seen a rich man. I have never seen a man as rich as all men ought to be, or with an adequate command of nature. The pulpit and the press have many commonplaces denouncing the thirst for wealth, but if men should take these moralists at their word and leave off aiming to be rich, the moralists would rush to rekindle at all hazards this love of power in the people, lest civilization should be undone. How intimately our knowledge of the system of the universe rests on all of this, and a true economy in a state or an individual will forget its frugality in behalf of claims like these. They should own who can administer, not they who hoard and conceal, not they who, the greater proprietors they are, are only the greater beggars, but they whose work carves out work for more, opens a path for all. For he is the rich man in whom the people are rich, 
and he is the poor man in whom the people are poor, and how to give all access to the masterpieces of art and nature is the problem of civilization. And this problem of civilization, of giving access to all, to understand and comprehend and pull out from nature new forms of wealth. This is the challenge that we're here trying to solve. Bringing the tools, the understanding, and the knowledge to as many as we can in the hopes that maybe by some mere accident, the right person latches onto the right idea at the right moment, and we're all the richer for it. But not only that, we must, and we are, trying our best to instill the idea of continuing to spread knowledge and understanding as far afield from these walls as possible. Because the solutions to the problems are not here, they are up here. And wherever your mind goes, you take with it the ability to observe and respond. And now, more than ever, in the age of fake news, it is most critical to learn to trust your own senses. To look at something, observe it for yourself, understand it for yourself, and keep your own notes. Not taking for granted and trusting some letters after somebody's name who published in some journal that they had it right. That this is possible and that is impossible. But to figure it out for yourself. Of all of the accomplishments that I saw on the stage today in the demos and the pride it filled me with, I was most proud of one thing that probably seems really counterintuitive to a lot of people. I was most proud of the almost chorus-like response during the question and answer, well, we would actually have to research it to know. I, we, we need to check it out. We're not just going to fill you some line of bullshit and hope that you buy it. We're going to say, no, no, like we need to look. And looking is not as easy as it sounds. So we're going to look. We're going to take the notes. Create the records. We don't need to go ask somebody else. We can do it. And if ever I have felt like I saw in reality what I imagined almost six years ago when this idea popped up in my head, today was it. And so I'm genuinely grateful to all of the students, the faculty, our visitors, for doing all of the work. It is you who did it, all of it. And I couldn't be more proud of what you've done in six weeks, but I'm much more excited about what you'll do in the next six years. And then if you take what you've learned here from your experimentation in this brief period of time, in this artificial environment, back to where you came from, you'll never be alone. You'll never be without collaborators. They will gravitate around you like the moons of Jupiter. Because that's what knowledge and understanding do. They create a center, gravity, that other beings, less dedicated, cannot help but move around. And the more you invest in that, in 
growing your own capacity to understand and helping those around you to understand, it will pay far more dividends than you could possibly imagine sitting here right now. You don't need to go hire people with lots of degrees if you know how to help people find information and understanding necessary to do the task in front. And each task is a new opportunity to test your limits and try out new powers. But in all of your seeking, in all of your doing, remember that if you forget the accounting, you won't have much room to do anymore. And that's why I wanted to leave you with some thoughts about money. Because if you take care of it, if you care about it, really care about it, a lot of the problems that entrepreneurs face, that scientists face, that technologists face, will be minimized. They won't disappear. I mean, Elon Musk has money, but he doesn't have enough money. He doesn't have enough money to do what he wants to do. And my message to you is if you ever have enough money to do what you want to do, then you should retire and not do anything at all. Go sit on the beach. But rather, your appetite should expand faster than your resources. Your curiosity, your ambition, your dream should be growing at a much faster pace. And that will inspire and pull you, sometimes drag you, kicking and screaming in the direction that your genius wants you to go. And the scrapes and bruises that you will pick up along the way are the lessons that will remind you later, ah, I can make it through this difficulty too. I promised the students, the last time I recited a poem, I recited the gods of the copybook headings, which is kind of a depressing poem. And I promised them, oh no, the last one was Proof Rock, which is even more depressing. So I promised them that we would end on an optimistic note. So I, I will leave you with, the, with uh, a few thoughts from Longfellow in his poem, A Psalm of Life. And the word psalm means literally a song of praise. So this is Longfellow praising life itself. He says, tell me not in mournful numbers, life is but an empty dream, for the soul is dead that slumbers and things are not what they see. Life is real, life is earnest, and the grave is not its goal. From dust thou art, to dust returnest, was not spoken of the soul. Not enjoyment and not sorrow is our destined end or way, but to act that each tomorrow finds us farther than today. Art is long and time is fleeting, and our hearts, though stout and brave, still, like muffled drums, are beating funeral marches to the grave. In the world's broad field of battle, in the bivouac of life, be not like dumb driven cattle, be a hero in the strife. Trust no future, however pleasant. Let the dead past bury its dead. Act, act in the living present, heart within and God o'erhead. Lives of great men all remind us we can make our lives sublime and departing leave behind us footprints on the sands of time. Footprints that perhaps another sailing o'er life's solemn main, a forlorn and shipwrecked brother, seeing, may take heart again. Let us then be up and doing, with a heart for any fate, still achieving, still pursuing, 
Learn to labor and to wait. Thank you, Skinner. And on behalf of students, faculty, and everyone who's involved in our sphere, uh, we have one more question. Actually, we call this a field supervisor. supporting our presenters and listening to the ideas. We know that what started in this room, what started in the past six weeks, is not going to stop here. And that's what keeps us coming back over and over again. So be on the lookout for more information from Exosphere about future programs. Please tell a friend. And uh, with that, disturb the universe. Yeah.